Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session! Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawikad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabig undaje kaye ugug kakina eneagizig ene kuka megak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space. But we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Well, good morning. Bienvenue, welcome to the February edition of Family Medicine Grand Rounds. My name is Doug Archibald. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation for the Department of Family Medicine. And um, today's Family Medicine Grand Rounds will be brought to you by uh, the Pembroke Family Medicine team. And generally, uh, for Family Medicine Grand Rounds, I'm the moderator, but today, Um, I'm going to hand the reins over to the site director, Dr. Richard Johnson, and he will introduce our speakers and moderate today's session. But before he does, I am going to introduce Richard. He's a family doctor in Pembroke, as well as site director of the Pembroke Residence Program, chief of family practice at the Pembroke Regional Hospital, and co-chair of the Renfrew County and South Algonquin Primary Care Network. He recently was hired as the clinical lead of the Ottawa Valley Ontario Health Team, previously called Network 24. He's seven years into practice after having graduated from the Pembroke Residency Program, and his passion is maximizing the health of residents in Renfrew County, and supported by his wife and two lovely children who attempt to keep him balanced. So with that introduction, Richard, over to you. Thank you so much, Doug and Maddie, for arranging this. Um, so today we thought um, we'd, we'd focus on presentations that kind of deal with uh, key themes for us here in uh, the Renfrew County region. And uh, for us, attachment to primary care and, and how best to serve the unattached patients in our region um, is, is the major force that brings together primary care uh, in our region. Um, the recent Primary Care Inspire report Um, puts the number of uh, patients uh, in our region that are uncertainly attached to primary care at around 20%, um, which is significantly higher than the Ontario average there uh, of 11%. Um, this, this greatly affects our communities um, in terms of rates to the emergency department. And when you combine that with, you know, uh, you know, our population being more vulnerable, um, having a higher burden of disease, um, the outcomes uh, of patients for all, all of these factors are, are certainly magnified. 
Um, so there's many approaches to um, attaching people to primary care. Uh, the standard uh, tried and true recruitment of physicians and NPs, the growing the learner pipeline by having more med students and residents uh, are all certainly part of our plans. And, and we have you know, groups working on all those things. Um, but today we wanted to bring to you kind of two approaches that are more innovative um, that we thought would be uh, interesting for the wider group to hear about. Um, so our uh, first presentation today, um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Fitzsimon. Um, the presentation will be about uh, 15 to 20 minutes long, and then we'll have about five minutes for questions uh, after that. You can put your questions in the chat um, and or raise your hand after the presentation and I'll, I'll moderate and field those. Um, and then after that, we'll have uh, Dr. Jason Malinowski who will give his presentation with about the same time frame um, and questions preceding uh, that uh, presentation. So first off with uh, Dr. Jonathan Fitzsimon. So he graduated from Sheffield University a Medical School in the UK in 2007. From 2009 to 10, he worked as a volunteer physician in a rural Bolivia before returning to the UK to complete the general practice specialty training program. He moved to Ontario in 2014 and started a family practice in Armcrack. In 2020, he was appointed medical lead of the Renfrew County Virtual Treatment and Assessment Center. And that's what he presented uh, to this group on last year. Um, over the next year, he became medical lead of the Petawawa Integrated Virtual Care Program and assistant professor at the University of Ottawa Department of Family Medicine, and more recently as, the, as a clinician researcher at the Institut du Savoie Montfort. His research program investigates virtual care as a means of improving access to primary care in rural, remote, and underserviced communities. He recently completed a two-year term as Chief of Family Medicine at the Arm Prior Regional Health and continues in the role of attending family physician at a large retirement home in Arm Prior. He was recently the recipient of the OMA's 2021 Glenn Sawyer Service Award. So without further ado, Jonathan, take it away. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Richard, and, uh, and I really am delighted to have another opportunity to present again at, uh, at Grand Rounds. I'm excited to share with you more of the groundbreaking, uh, innovative work being done in Renfrew County, uh, particularly in the field of virtual care. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, I've had a, a lot of help from uh, Dr. Lisbieri and uh, from Dr. Liddy, uh, Dirk, Eric, and many others at DFM. Um, and, and I've been able to develop that research program that Richard mentioned. Um, look, I'm a family doctor at heart. I believe passionately that everyone should have access to, to high quality primary care. Um, and I'm a, a shameless advocate of the fantastic professional life that family physicians can have working in a, a rural setting like Renfrew County. Um, for those of you less familiar with Renfrew County, let me give you a quick overview. Um, so we cover 7,500 square kilometers, the largest county in Ontario. That's about one and a half times the size of PEI, um, population around 108,000. So there are five uh, larger towns that do have a community hospital. So on prior where I'm based is at the, the southeastern edge, uh, about 45 minutes from Ottawa. And then you move up the Ottawa Valley through Renfrew, Pembroke, Barry's Bay, and then Deep River right at the northwest tip of the county. And the town of Petawawa has a close association with a large military garrison and a large number of military families who live there. Um, but there are many smaller, more remote communities, uh, including the First Nation community of Pickwick-Onagon. And as Richard said, we've had this chronic challenge in recruiting enough family physicians to Renfrew County to provide attachment to primary care to all residents. Uh, no walk-in centres, no urgent care clinics anywhere in the county. Um, so, you know, 20% of the population, that's over 22,000 people who have to rely on an emergency department as their only means of accessing any form of health care. So when I presented at Grand Rounds last year, I talked about uh, Renfrew County's COVID-19 Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre, or VTAC as it's now commonly known. You know, we realised we didn't have the resources to put COVID assessment centres in every town, and that one large assessment centre would not meet the needs of many residents. 
Um, so, you know, we we sort of uh, we decided to leverage the, the the connections that we have between um, the uh, primary care hospitals, public health, many other healthcare providers, and we developed this uh, this hybrid model. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we could um, provide testing and assessment for all residents. Uh, we wanted to protect our healthcare workers, uh, protect our EDs, 911 paramedics for genuine emergencies, um, but also make sure that nobody was left behind suffering at home in silence. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that non-COVID issues didn't become a COVID issue. You know, people forced to travel to an emergency department and sit for hours in a crowded waiting room. You know, suddenly your urinary tract infection become, can become a COVID issue because of, because of what you've had to do to get treatment. So, you know, VTAC uh, provided access to family physicians for a virtual assessment. And then our community paramedics provided COVID testing. So drive through sites, pop up locations and eventually more regular scheduled sites. Uh, and for vulnerable housebound patients, the paramedics could go to, to patients' homes. So we had this blend of in person, at home and virtual options. You know, VTAC set the precedent for uh, a service that could blend these different types of care. Um, it improved access to, to family physicians for those that weren't attached to their own family physician. And, you know, we particularly established this synergy uh, between family physicians and, and community paramedics. VTAC's been hugely successful and continues to be hugely successful at providing acute episodic care. You know, we kept people out of the emergency department. We've given them access to a family physician but it's not comprehensive primary care. You know, it's not well placed to offer good continuity of care, build a strong patient doctor relationship, health promotion, disease prevention, and it's challenging doing, you know, best practice chronic disease management in this way. And of course, you know, there are times when in-person physical examination is required and procedures that can't be done over a phone or a video link. So the integrated virtual care program started to take shape. We wanted to go the next step. We wanted to learn from how we developed and implemented VTAC, leverage VTAC, um, but develop a service that could provide genuine comprehensive primary care to some of the unattached residents of the county. Look, we've used the CFPC's patient medical home as our core guide, um, especially pillar six comprehensive team-based care with family physician leadership. And so the integrated virtual care program is currently established uh, within the Petawawa Centennial Family Health Center. We leveraged VTAC, identify local residents who have been accessing care through VTAC um, because they did not have a family physician. And we attach them to a named family physician who works predominantly remotely um, but uh, that means we have a much uh, larger pool of physicians that we can access. Um, and those physicians that want to work with us can choose the size of their roster and therefore the amount of time they commit to IBC. But the physicians are embedded within the, the Petawawa Centennial Family Health Centre. Um, so all of the allied health, admin support, IT support, and everything else that comes with being part of a family health team. We partner closely once again with the community paramedics. And crucially, we have the close knowledge, the understanding and the workflows to, to help patients connect with uh, and navigate existing local healthcare resources. So we've taken that initial concept from VTAC and we ensure that patients have access to in-person, at home and virtual care options, depending on their individual needs and preferences. So the virtual care options, we offer the full spectrum of, of virtual care. So most calls are, are via telephone and many things as we learn through VTAC can be dealt with over telephone, but also video, 
also secure messaging. So for example, sending digital photographs securely for your physician to see. And I'm gonna come back in a few moments to talk a bit more about the enhanced video concept that we also introduce with IVC. Many of the uh, uh, issues, particularly acute episodic care can be dealt with during that, that virtual encounter with the physician. Physicians can order tests, investigations, they can refer, including e-referral. And of course, all prescriptions can be done electronically to, uh, to the patient's local pharmacy. But when an in-person examination or procedure is required, um, then we can utilize the multidisciplinary team. So we have a nurse practitioner at the, uh, at the family health center who has time specifically set aside to support the, the IVC physicians. So if you like, they can refer to an allied health colleague to do a specific um, examination or procedure. But the key is, um, oh, I'm sorry, we can also use the, uh, the local health resources, whether it's mental health, palliative care, community pharmacy, everything in between. But the key is that the patient's named family physician uh, remains, um, uh, the, the, the lead re retains overall responsibility for, for that patient's primary care. So I mentioned enhanced video encounter, and one of the criticisms of virtual care, one of the limitations is what cannot be done via virtual care. So for example, there are limitations on physical examination. But what we found and what we're starting to introduce now within the IVC program is that there is a lot of technology that can assist us. So digital Bluetooth connected stethoscopes, um, ophthalmoscopes, otoscopes, you can start to do um, uh, specialist examinations, physical examinations. Um, if you can have um, the idea, uh, and of course, a whole range of different exam cameras, if you can have that blend, that hybrid of uh, in-person and virtual care. So being connected with the Family Health Centre means that people can come to their local clinic. It has the added advantage of also providing that safety uh, of, of, um, of being in a clinic. Um, not all people are safe in their own home. And so we want to sort of be able to offer the people the opportunity that they can still see their family physician, albeit virtually, but from the safe environment of their, of their local health center. And so if we provide an allied health professional, a medical office assistant or an RPN, within the examination room, they can set up the technology. If that's the limitation, someone doesn't have high-speed internet or they're not tech savvy enough to, to set up their video encounter at home, we can do that for them in the clinic. And then we have the allied health professional on hand in the same way that we've done telemedicine for years with specialists, now we can do it in primary care. I'm not sure if Jeff is on the, uh, the, on the call today, um, but uh, he wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention the next step that we're hoping to also introduce, which is the, uh, the HoloLens. You know, te technology is just moving so, so quickly um, that these additions that we're going to try and sort of develop and introduce within IVC enable more and more care to be delivered remotely um, uh, via virtual means. So that's what I mean by an enhanced video encounter. Okay, let me give you some of the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, the flow of how IVC has worked so far. So we did get some funding from Ontario Health to implement this program. And that started, um, well, technically it started in September 1st. I don't think we actually got the approval until mid-September. Um, but what it meant was that uh, during September, we were able to build up um, the team, take on some additional um, IT and admin staff. And we've also brought in extra time for um, the family health team pharmacist. Um, so when we started enrolling patients, we sent out consents and, uh, and health questionnaires uh, digitally. People completed those. They could do it manually within the clinic if they wanted to do it that way. But we were able to build their health history, uh, develop their CPP, get them registered on the electronic medical record, 
do a medication review for those with multiple medications actually pre sort of discuss with our pharmacist narcotics agreements so there were all these many steps even before that first appointment with the doctor so that first appointment the traditional meet and greet was actually very effective it wasn't wasted trying to sort of just get all of that detailed administration it was already done by the by the family health team staff and so from mid-November, we've been providing comprehensive primary care um, to patients that are enrolled through this program. And the idea is that we'll continue to enroll until the end of March. And then those patients will continue to receive the care from their physicians. And we'll start to do more evaluation of the, of the outcomes of the program. So far, we're close to a thousand attached patients. A thousand was our target for the end of March. So we're almost there before the end of February. I think we'll probably reach around 1200 by, uh, uh, by the end of March. 1200 appointments already with one of the family physicians and over 250 with the allied health. And just, uh, it's interesting to note that of those allied health appointments, I think it's 76 was, uh, was yesterday's number, have been with uh, the nurse practitioner that I said who has specifically allocated time with the IVC physicians. So less than 10% of the appointments that the family doctors have, do they need to request a nurse practitioner to do an in-person um, follow-up because they couldn't complete what they wanted to do virtually. You know, and already 74 people were identified as not having their um, cervical screening um, up to date. And we've been able to bring that up to date. 26 with, with mammograms and where we're starting to do some of that health promotion and disease prevention, referring people to smoking cessation, for example. You know, this is what we mean when we talk about comprehensive team-based primary care with family physician leadership. And these are all patients who just didn't have access to any primary care previously. You know, let's, let's not forget, these are people that only had care through an emergency department, and now they have this. And they love it, not surprisingly, because like I say, previously, they only had to go to the emergency department to get their care. And I think one of the most rewarding things for, for me is that th these numbers uh, are up until the end of last month. We're just about to run February's numbers again. But um, our, our data analyst that does this has told me that for the last three weeks running, we have had 100% satisfaction returns on, on the questionnaires. You know, we're learning as we go along. You know, there were a few people that had some issues, be it digitally or be it with the sort of onboarding process. Um, you know, a new, a new system has its has its sort of tweaking to be done, but we're learning as we go, um, and uh, and we're seeing that the patients are are really delighted with the service that we're providing. So I, I do feel that integrated virtual care goes that next step. It takes us beyond the acute episodic care provided by VTAC. We're providing attachment to a named family physician. You know who your doctor is. Um, but we're, we're staying true to the patient's medical home, comprehensive team-based care with family physician leadership. And what we've done is, uh, you know, our, our, our sort of mantra is in-person, at-home and virtual care options, depending on each patient's individual needs and preferences. And by doing this, we've, we've started to chip away. We're moving the needle, you know, a thousand people now have attachment to primary care who didn't have it six months ago. You know, it's a big problem, it's a big challenge, but each of these things is starting to make progress. Thanks for listening. Thank you again for, for giving me the opportunity to, to present at Grand Rounds. Um, and as Richard said, I think we've got about five minutes uh, if anybody does have any questions before, uh, before we move to Jason's presentation. So feel free to raise your hands, put questions in the chat. Simone. This is a great program, Jonathan. Thanks for sharing this. I'm actually really interested in something that might be a little peripheral to the main presentation, but still important that the context of the patient-centered medical home is at the very beginning, you talk about the role of or about the paramedics and 
uh, I'm, I'm not sure I got what their role was. And you talked about linking patients to healthcare resources in the region, but I'm wondering about whether you have any initiative to help link them to not health care, but health and social resources. And are the paramedics doing that kind of stuff? Thanks, Simone. And I have to say, your presentation that you gave at the academic ground runs was like really inspiring when you talked about that sort of uh, building that patient doctor relationship via virtual means. Um, and I think Thank we're you. starting to see what you found that over time, you know, particularly that six month point you can actually start to develop that trust in physician that maybe initially you don't get that, that work. So I, I appreciate the work you're doing as well. And, uh, and, and we found it really helpful. Happy to collaborate in the future. We'll yeah. talk at the retreat. <laughs> For sure. Um, in terms of the paramedics. So when we talked about the enhanced video, doing that in the clinic, think about all of that stuff in a backpack. Give it to a <laughs> yeah. paramedic. Now you can do an enhanced video in a patient's home. So you can send a paramedic to a vulnerable housebound patient, do all of the vital signs assessment. But if they want to talk to their physician, they get their laptop, they put their webcam, they've got the stethoscope, they can do all of that now remotely. So that's the at home sort of piece of it. Got it. Um, we also have the paramedic remote monitoring program. So it's, you know, it's been the flavor of the last two years because of COVID at home monitoring. But actually most of the people we've used it for is for uh you know, it's for congestive heart failure, it's for COPD patients. It's been able to do that ongoing digital remote monitoring, uh, and that's run through the paramedics as well. Um, one of the things that Petawawa has just uh, been successful in is, is linking with a, a midwifery program. So having a connection between the family health center and, and, uh, and another community health resource means that IVC can be part of that as well. And so our physicians can connect with that. And the midwifery program is a, a huge win for, for Judy Hill, the executive director at Petawawa and, and bringing that on board. Great, thank you. Jason? Hi, Jonathan, that was, uh, that was excellent. And I knew sort of part of that already, but uh, to, to see it all in the big picture, I think is, uh, is really interesting for me and, and our folks on the Western side of Rancher County. Um, but for the other folks on the line, I don't really want to underscore it. Like, I, I really want to emphasize, you know, the, the importance of the paramedic service. Um, that's been so super helpful. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the demographic is around our empire as much, but out in our area, there's a significant um, number of patients who are isolated geographically, um, either by circumstance or sometimes by choice. Um, and um, to be able to get out and get a set of vital signs or a blood draw or a point of care INR um, has just been fabulous. So, you know, it's great how that works into your, your system. And it's um, um, for some of the folks that, that feed into uh, Jonathan's uh, system and for VTAC, it's been very seamless. Uh, so moving on to our uh, next presentation. So Dr. Jason Malinowski, so he's out in Barry's Bay. So he's a full service rural family physician embracing all that it means to be a rural generalist and a resource to his community. He's an award-winning teacher and a promoter of rural family medicine to all of his learners. He's a key piece of medical leadership of primary care, long-term care and hospice palliative care um, in our region. Jason, take it away. Okay, thanks, Richard. Uh, if you don't mind popping the slides up there, I'm not uh, I'm not as entertaining as Jonathan, uh, and I don't have the Liverpool lilt. But uh, just uh, let me know at the end if you can tell that I've been in Western Renfrew County for the past twenty years. Um, so, as uh, as Richard had said. This is another piece of the attaching uh, unattached patients uh, into primary care. Um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about my experience uh, onboarding a physician assistant into my practice. Okay, Richard, we'll get to the next one there. I have no financial conflicts of interest. No one has decided to pay me for doing any of this. Okay, so I don't I didn't want to uh, duplicate uh, Jonathan's slides, but Barry's Bay, as you can tell, we are about two hours. Uh, west of Ottawa. We are two hours from Peterborough, two hours from Kingston. And my wife and I like to joke, if you get in the car and drive for two hours in any direction, you can find a Starbucks. All right. So we are two hours by car. Um, when you're in the back of an ambulance with a sick patient, um, an hour or an hour and a half, 
Um, but if you get in a, if you're a patient <clears throat> who's repatriated back to our hospital with um, patient services, patient repatriation transport services, sometimes it's three or four hours because they like to take that little dip, you know, up around Lake Dory, up around, around Lake Center um, and get a good tour of the back roads. So two hours for you and me, uh, except for if, if we're in an ambulance. Okay, next one. So <clears throat> the primary care part out here in Barry's Bay is, is, has two parts, right? So the Madawaska Valley Family Health Team was, was established about three years ago with one of the latest tranches of family health teams. Um, and that is serves as the umbrella for the Madawaska Valley uh, Family Health Organization, which has been going for about 15 years now. Um, and we provide the primary care in this area um, from <clears throat> bordering sort of Madawaska area to the to the west, but even even still, I do have patients that come to me from Whitney and Madawaska. Um, I have patients that come to me from uh, Pembroke, Petawawa, um, none from Ironprior as far as I know. Um, but we get patients in our catchment area from about an hour in every direction uh, because of the challenges getting primary care. Next one. Thanks. So our family health organization um, has six doctors uh, of various ages and practice sizes. By, by a, a quirk of the demographics, I've inherited kind of all the chief of everything medical in this area for now, um, as we onboard our, our younger med staff. So there's six of us now, I'm kind of the middle of the sandwich. Um, but our, a lot of our newer grads are actually from the University of Ottawa, uh, Pembroke, uh, Department of Family Medicine which has been excellent. So let me put a plug in for the, uh, for the, Pembroke, for the Pembroke program, because uh, it's fed us um, two new grads now, and uh, we're hoping for more in the future. Our family health team has two nurse practitioners um, who have been great to take on primary care patients. One RPN, um, we've, we're funded for one full-time social worker, um, and she's been excellent. Uh, and we have a 0.4 dietitian as well. So all these services, um, with the allied health have been in place for the past uh, three years or so, as I said. Being, being in a rural area, you know, all our docs cover, um, they cover hospital, we cover long-term care, uh, just back when Richard, if you don't mind. Um, we cover a long-term care, um, we do our palliative home visits, uh, and we both, we all cover our, our patients at the two-bed hospice uh, attached to the hospital. Uh, we don't have OB or anesthesia uh, or an OR in Barry's Bay to cover. Uh, but we also don't have any specialists in town, so we rely on each other uh, very heavily to to be the the safety net for patients, um, whether it's through the emergency department uh, or flowing to the inpatient unit, or flowing to long term care or to the hospice. Um, <clears throat> and so residents ask me, you know, do do many of your docs have the plus one uh, to do a merge in Barry's Bay? As far as our local group, none do, none, none of none of us have that. Um, the only plus one in Barry's Bay. Um, is me uh, with the plus one in palliative medicine. Having said that, we are recruiting, we're open to um, a plus ones in ER who wanna do family and ER or a plus one in uh, care of the elderly. Uh, and uh, also another plus one in, in palliative medicine would be an excellent resource for our area. So I asked myself, you know, you know, why should I get a PA? And this all stemmed from probably a year or two and talking to Richard, I say, Richard, you look happy. You know, Richard wears a lot of hats too. Um, why are you so happy? And he said, well, I've just got this, I've got this new PA uh, and I haven't done, a, since she's come, I haven't, I haven't signed off a form since she's gotten here. I'm like, that, that's pretty good. So, you know, when I look at my inbox and this is my inbox on a, on a good day at the end of the day, you know, I've got labs to sign off. I've got incoming stuff. I've got messages from staff. Um, and then every spring, right, Within, when the daffodils sprout, so do the, the forms from the tax people, um, and they seem to grow exponentially on my, uh, in my inbox as well. So I could use some help for this for sure. Next slide, Richard. Also, we have a pandemic. And um, in a small area like Barry's Bay, you know, the docs are heavily leaned on for the medical leadership you know, whether that be the IPAC part, uh, whether that be the vaccine part, um, whether that be um, uh, health human resources here as well, uh, managing um, hospital policies when it comes to infection control and all of that, um, you know, work self-isolation part. And so 
all this adding up and all this, so the different hats that I wear, I, you know, I really felt that patients were suffering in my office, right? And so the wait times were starting to creep up, which I hate. Um, I didn't want to be a doctor that had like a 12 week wait time for non-urgent appointments. Um, and, and every week it seemed like there was a new Zoom call or a Teams meeting that plopped on my schedule. Uh, sorry, Richard, often from Richard. Um, and you know, carve two more hours out of your day, you know, for the next sort of more urgent thing. And patients were getting patients were getting you know plopped further and further into the future. So I said, you know what, it's uh, it's time to make a change. Next one, Richard, if you don't mind. All right. So I started looking into into PA essentials, um, and around that time, I saw an ad come across my email for the, uh, the physician assistant career start program, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second. Um, but so, so, you know, how could a PA be helpful? We had a PA in the hospital probably about a dozen years ago as a kind of a pilot in our emergency department. Um, and then the pilot ended and it wasn't, um, as, wasn't enough of a, um, a love connection that we wanted to continue with the program. There was some role confusion. There was a bit of, um, it, it was hard to say at the time, you know, whether it was the right fit for us. Now, um, in primary care, and as I'll talk about later, you know, into the hospital again, I, I think it can be the right fit for us because this model has matured a little bit. You know, so the physician assistant, you know, it's not an independent or a regulated practitioner, right? They are highly skilled professionals. Um, and this is stuff that I get from the from the Kappa website, right? Canadian Association for Physician Assistants, right? Um, they uh, support physicians in all healthcare settings, right? Whether it be primary care, long term care, uh, surgery, um, hosp other hospital, inpatient, etc. Um, and they can do things that you can you can delegate to physician assistants things from the regulated health practitioners act um, that they're not able to do themselves anybody can take a history they can perform possibly parts of a physical exam those aren't those aren't you know, um, discounted by the regulated health professionals act uh, but now i can delegate them to um, order some tests i can delegate them to write some prescriptions i can delegate them to do some injections um, and it's uh, under my supervision, it's been super helpful. Okay, next one, Richard. So as you may know, if you've worked with physician assistants, they all work under a set of medical directives, right? So this tells you the who, the what, the where, the when, the how of what they're able to do, right? So I, Jason, the doctor, are able to delegate to Sylvie, the PA, uh, the procedure of write a prescription for Synthroid uh, for patient X, with the inclusion and exclusion criteria, non-pregnant, um, non-child patient, for example. Um, and then with that directive, um, Sylvie is to write the prescription under my directive and that note goes to pharmacy, but then also under the same directive assesses when the uh, TSH is supposed to be checked again, for example. Um, so again, another plug for the Canadian Association of Physician Assistants, um, lots of FAQs on their website, which are helpful if you're considering looking at a PA, how it might fit into your practice in the future. Um, and also it's worth a breeze by of the CPSO policy on delegation of controlled acts as well. Every time I read the C one of CPSO policy, I, I learn something new. It's interesting, interesting stuff. Okay, next one. Okay. So I'm, I'm sold already. I've talked to Richard. I've talked to some folks at TOH. Maybe this is where I want to go. I want to reduce my inbox. I want to reduce my wait time. How much is this going to cost me? So you do a little bit of digging and ballpark, you know, gross salary for um, PAs somewhere in the 90 to $100,000 range. This was a few years ago now. Um, the early start program will subsidize as part of that and i won't get into a ton of the details of that but we'll subsidize part of that income for the first two years uh and then after that you're kind of on your own um so then next slide richard so look so how am i going to pay for this right so if i assume so it costs all in for sylvie who's my pa if we say just a, a back of the envelope uh, calculation hundred thousand right how many new patients what I have to take on to make up this difference. I had a kind of a ballpark in my mind. You know, it's not 20, but it's also not 20,000. 
So I do a little bit of the sort of the back of the back of the envelope calculations, you know, our family health organization, our salary, um, a little bit of the fee for service part kind of mixed in there. Um, a bit of a comprehensive care payment that we get for being rural physicians out here. Not sure how that all works. Um, so divide that by the number of rostered patients that I have, which at this point is about 1,250. Um, and then next slide, Richard, 362 patients. Have I taken on 362 new patients since I've gotten the PA? No, probably about 80 so far, but we're continuing to increase. So part of the reason is not economically necessarily, and I'm probably taking a little bit of a, um, a hit economically for my PA, but at this point, as far as my peace of mind, uh, my mental health, uh, my gray hair, um, and my kids who are growing quickly, uh, it was the right thing to do for me. Next one, please. Okay. So the PA Career Start Program, that email that breezes by our inboxes periodically, gives us, gives us a time-limited financial support to facilitate the transition of PA grads into the healthcare system to help address patient care needs. So this is for new grads uh, of the PA Career Start Program. So, and there's a limited number every year. So I put my application in for the PA Career Start Program. I said, you know, maybe you would get somebody. Recruitment in rural areas, as you might know, is, is challenging on every front, right? Whether it be doctor, whether it be plumber, electrician, nursing, RT, dietitian, and also for PA. So I put an application in, I, I, one respondent, um, she seemed very good, but she had family ties to the GTA, and it, it was fairly clear that she wanted to settle towards that direction, which she did. Still, though, I thought, you know what, I, I, I still would like to do this. So I did, I did advertise for a PA, and next slide, if you don't mind, Richard. So talking again with Richard and the docs at TOH, um, I ultimately hired a PA. Uh, who actually was living in our area and was retiring from military. So not a new grad, kind of a mid-career PA um, who was uh, very experienced, but especially with the um, um, military type demographic. Um, and she's been really helpful. So, you know, I've been able to, um, you know, I've gone to some courses through um, geriatrics. Uh, she attends the family medicine refresher. She attends our small group um, problem-based learning through McMaster, those modules. Um, and she's really getting up to speed and, very, and, and working well into the clinic. So this is all about attachment to primary care, right? So, you know, before this, I was, you know, I had, 1100 and some patients i've probably taken about 80 or 90 since sylvie has joined me um, i've taken um, more of the long-term care patients one of our local docs retired from long-term care and so it was easy for me to um, onboard a dozen or two dozen long-term care patients which i wouldn't have been able to do and we would have had to distribute them to the other physicians um, and then because I'm medical director for various different things, I get requests for you know TB skin tests. I get requests for work notes for um, you know, long-term care PSWs, um, you know pre-employment physicals, all those things. I'm able to do a lot of those things now uh, with my PA who has the time to fit that into the schedule and work with her to to do those um, uninsured tasks, uh, but also some uninsured tasks for patients that are have no doctor at all, right? You know, there's a lot of sawmills out in our area, um, logging, trucking, everybody needs a driver's physical, right? If you don't have a family doctor, it's insane where you need to go to try and get um, a driver's physical. Emerge doesn't really like to do that, and there's no walking clinics. So I'm able to offer those kind of services for our area as well. So, a little bit of the transition was with patients, right? I mean, I, I have learners all the time. And so they're used to seeing different faces. But now, you know, with Sylvie, you know, the transition is you can see Sylvie now a few times over the course of six months saying you can develop a rapport with her, uh, similar to what you had with me. The patients are really reassured by that. Um, it's been a change in adaptation for the staff as far as triaging and booking, um, where I'm not 
maybe not necessarily available for three weeks, but you know, I can get you in to see Sylvie this afternoon. Uh, we can at least start there. She can do most of most of your um, assessment uh, and talk to the doctor and, and talk about next steps from there. So patients are, are really getting, uh, I would say on a good groove with the PA and how things work here. There are always gonna be those patients who wanna see the doctor no matter what. The patients that don't wanna see learners of any sort, uh, I'm gonna to wanna to wait for me, but the vast majority, uh, very satisfied. And the wait times come down probably, you know, by a number of weeks since I've been able to onboard the PA. Okay, so we're still kind of early. I'm still in the first year with my PA and things are adapting and evolving. Well, she has some skills that she's developing with geriatrics, uh, for example, where she didn't have a ton of experience before. Um, so we're, we continue to look at the directives. You know, I was happy that Richard was able to provide me with you know, two inches of, of medical directives for the PA from the Pembroke program uh, that we refined for our area as well. And we continue to refine those as different situations come up. I have a lot of questions from the other doctors about who is this new person in my office, right? Like, how is the PA working? Um, do we have access to them? I'm gonna say, you know what? There's a doctor in the pod next to me who is retiring. Uh, for any new grad that wants to come, or if you want to play a little chess in the clinic building, would you want to share some time with a PA? I think that would be excellent. Uh, we've already got a lot of the groundwork laid, which is which is which has been wonderful. And then, as you can see from the different hats that I wear, I'm part of the time in the emergency department. Uh, my week of inpatient ward coverage is starting to come up. Right now, on the primary care side, because of the nurse practitioners, and some of the new docs, um, we're doing not too bad as far as the unattached patient primary care part where I need some help um, is on the hospital side. And so, you know, could I take more ER shifts knowing um, that potentially I have, I have an example of ER medical directives for a physician assistant that I could adapt for us. Could I take more ER shifts and have Sylvie work with me in the ER and while chief of staff at the hospital work with the hospital to um, do the credentialing part for the PA. Um, can they help me with uh, inpatient ward coverage as well? Or while I'm doing those things, you know, I have to, I have to cancel, you know, at least two thirds or, or three thirds of my office day uh, for a last minute ER shift. Um, now Sylvie can cover and see the patients in my office where they would have been uh, booted to the future otherwise. So really building on what's happening in Renfrew County right now, um, the Pembroke Family Medicine Teaching Unit has two full-time PAs now, uh, and now I have the third. Um, and I think, and Richard could talk about his own experience, but you know, being able to, to onboard more of the unattached patients um, you know, at the teaching unit, especially, I think has been very super helpful. And, and Richard seems happy. Uh, next slide, please. All right. One last kind of word. You may be hearing things about regulation of PAs. So in the last calendar year, the last 12 months, um, the government has introduced some legislation now that's gonna bring PAs under the CPSO regulatory authority. So they're gonna have their own class of registration uh, through the CPSO. Um, and it's following other provinces which already have uh, regulated PAs, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Alberta, et cetera. I'm uncertain how it's all gonna work. I think the devil's gonna be in the details. I think a lot of it will still be under the delegation model for physicians. And it still won't be necessarily independent practitioners, but this may help with some of the um, regulatory things regarding physicians and delegations. It may help with uh, the ease of PAs being integrated into practices. So I think we're at the thin, of, thin edge of the wedge. Um, and uh, you know, I'd be happy to talk to any of you folks uh, offline if you wanted to ask me about my experience with PA and, and pick out some of the finer details that I didn't, uh, wasn't able to talk about in my presentation. Last slide there, Richard. Okay. For a guy like me in Barry's Bay, I'm the chief of everything. I got a bunch of meetings. I got a bunch of hats. Um, the PA has really helped me. 
to reduce my wait times. Um, it's really helped me to improve my patient satisfaction, uh, which is partially related to wait times, but also partly related to uh, the pharmacy faxed me a prescription request that I didn't get to it for two weeks. Uh, now I can get to it. Um, and I'm, I'm happier. It's, it's, um, it's better. It's not maybe financially lucrative, um, but it is, um, it's going to be sustainable for me and I'm able to take on 80 new patients uh, off of the list and, uh, and more as time goes on. And I leave it open for questions. And I'm glad I didn't do that whole thing on me. Thank you, Jason, for that awesome uh, presentation. Um, so feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat or raise your hand. So Jonathan's question first, he's asking, do you have to be physically present for supervision of your PA when they're seeing patients? Yeah, I'm going to say not necessarily. I know other docs who have uh, PAs who really stretch that supervision part geographically. I'm not comfortable doing that. Um, I would defer also to Richard's experience with his PAs. Um, I don't see face-to-face -face every patient that the uh, PA sees. Um, but usually I'm on, I'm on site or in town, either at long-term care or here where the, uh, the PA can get me, um, in short notice. And I'm always available by phone. And certainly what I would say about that is, uh, you want to make sure that you are available. Certainly when onboarding a new staff member, I found it helpful to, you know, see most of the patients, uh, like you do, um, just to get, you know, a sense of, you know, where the skills lie and that sort of thing. But then slowly you're able to expand that, um, and just be a present, um, via some virtual means, uh, kind of as needed. Certainly want to make sure that you're, you know, within the province and those sort of CPSO kind of rules come into play. That's right. And, and it's, and it's kind of prorated to, you know, how serious an interaction it is, right? I don't need to necessarily be available for a, a simple prescription renewal necessarily. Uh, but if a PA is going to do a, a procedure that I haven't seen them do before, uh, or if I have seen them do before sometimes, uh, then I stick pretty close around and uh, are available uh, for patients if they have any questions, because ultimately uh, the buck stops with me if there's an untoward outcome. Marisa? Yeah, hi. Um, Jason, that was excellent. Um, every year we have considered um, a PA, so I would, uh, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, as a clinician teacher, any time that I have to delegate a skill to someone else, I worry that then my residents won't get this skill because certainly when they go in the community, they won't have all the luxuries of nursing support, et cetera, as we have, as I didn't when I went to the private practice or rural areas. So I wonder if your PA has a faculty position so that she can actually supervise and teach the residents these uh, extra skills like filling out forms, um, addressing, you know, prescription errors they make all the time that I get back from the pharmacy, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, that, because that would be helpful. So that's one. And then the second thing is, are you, is your practice responsible for uh, this person's salary or your team? I don't know how many physicians, I didn't catch that, are in your team. Because certainly that's the other thing is that how do we fund someone who's solely benefiting, say, one practice who has multiple responsibility like yourself, um, where then the rest of us have to uh, support their salary? Right, right. Good questions. Thank you. Um, I haven't asked my PA to supervise residents yet at this point. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention kind of earlier on there is with the, with the PA now in my practice with a, uh, with a finite space, uh, I found with learners, um, it's getting a little, it's getting a little tight, uh, and not finding a home for myself, uh, or for the nurse who just wants to do a quick injection. I've got all the exam rooms running. So one of the considerations is, you know, to, you know, to move along into the clinic and, and, you know, subsume some more rooms. So that's a, that's a cost consideration for sure. But no, I don't have them supervise residents or a faculty position at this point. 
um, but possibly in future, I think she would be a great teacher and, and the residents could learn a lot from her. Second question is, I fund this solely myself. Um, I don't have a sharing agreement with the other physicians yet, but if one of the other docs wanted to come on board uh, and share time with the physician assi assistant, then we could um, have a cost sharing agreement. I, I think it would be, um, and, and it's also necessary to make sure that it's, it's ironclad who the supervising physician is uh, at the time. And I think in Pembroke, maybe they have a couple of different physicians um, with one PA. Um, and to make sure that everybody signed off on all of the directives and everybody agrees with it. Jason, Jonathan, thank you so much for two great presentations. And Richard, thank you for facilitating. Great rounds, well done. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in today. And um, we look forward to, to seeing you again next month in March, and it'll be the uh, Civic that is up uh, to, uh, to present rounds. So please fill in your evaluations. Maddie's just put them in the chat. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you all again soon.